So around about a year ago, I made a video discussing the top five YouTubers I felt that become irrelevant by the year 2025. And I think here, a year later, it's about time to do a little check-in. That way you, my fair audience, can bask in the glory and genius of your humble Nesquik. And conveniently forget the parts where I was completely wrong. <laughs> Alright, look, we're going to look at the good, bad, and the ugly of my predictions and see just exactly where I've been right and where I've been wrong. First person on the list? Well, here's what you have to understand. This is a Nesquik list, so I cheated. And instead of just naming a single person, for number one, I listed an entire subgenre of content, the Storytime Animator community. Now, for those of you who don't know, Storytime Animators are a subgenre of animated content here on YouTube that it's much more personal. The idea is that you have some just relatable person, maybe a little quirky, telling stories about themselves and their lives. You know, I got bullied at school this one time. Oh my God, guys, pants are so weird. You know, it's, it's that kind of content. My theory was this, this kind of content got really big in the mid to late 2010s, partially because yes, it was very popular, people liked it, but also because it was algorithmically pushed. YouTube liked it and YouTube wanted it, so they bought more and more of it. This created a community that was already artificially inflated and larger than it really was naturally supposed to be. Meaning that as YouTube slowly took away that algorithmic support, so too would the community. And uh, holy shit have I been correct, hell yeah, can I get a hell yeah? Hell yeah, I did this, I, I got this one totally right. The community is dying. There are still a few people around, but oh man, the, the bottom has fallen out completely. I mean, here's the thing. I, I said this before in a previous video, but the people who watched these guys' content weren't really in it for the person or the personality, but instead the style, the genre of content. So as soon as these creators stopped making that kind of content, whoops, so too went away their audiences. You hate to see it, don't you? But it's true. By the way, can I also gloat about another prediction that was correct? I believe I said The Odd Ones Out was going to have a shitty Netflix kids show. Hell yeah, got the one right again. Thank you very much. Oh my god. I hope it was worth it, James. And as for Jaden Animations, the second largest in the entire community, uh, she's... <laughs> oh no. She's moved away from the whole story time shtick. And has become a fucking VTuber. I'm not kidding. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> Ah, oh, how the mighty have fallen, huh, oh, ladies and gentlemen. Look, it's pretty obvious, these people got bored of their own content, understandably. And they kind of ran out of personal stories to talk about, too. But look, the top people in the community, that's one thing. Really, when you look at it, though, a lot of the, the smaller people, they're just, they're gone. They're not even making content anymore, or their content they're making now is so different, nobody gives a shit about them anymore. And you know what? Good riddance. Because you know what? These people are living on easy street. They were making easy content. And you know what? You can only do that for so long. Now, let me be clear. All right, let me give the devil its due. Easy content and animation are not usually things you'd say in the same sentence, but here's what I mean. This was intellectually easy. This was creatively easy. There was no risk. These people knew that if they could just pump out one video a month in this genre and in this style of content, it would be an instant hit. It would get tons of success, outsized amounts of success, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of views. And I'm sorry, that's just not sustainable. That, that's just not going to last forever. And the fact that some of these people, I guess, earnestly thought it might, and are still trying to recapture the glory days, is just a little funny to me. Ethan Klein. Oh, what a flaccid decline that one's been. I mean, here's a question for you folks. If you're like me, you kind of stopped giving a shit about H3H3 after he stopped posting on his main channel. Is it just me, or does he only ever pop up in the collective conscious when he does something retarded? Like when he picks a fight with XYZ person, or he says some stupid shit here, or he gets sued by this guy. It's just like, like, oh my god, the guy basically just bounces from controversy to controversy, because I'm not sure if you've tried to watch his podcast recently. Y'all know, this is how easy it is to get views with my fucking name in these circles. 55 seconds? Who watches a 55 second video? It has 350,000 views. This has got to be one of his top viewed videos, right? Watch this shit. Let's see. Oh, it's not even close. Okay, arrogant. Oh my god, this, this is boring. What the fuck happened? This is incredibly low energy. Wh who wants to watch you on your own at this point? I, I mean, is it any wonder you have to have so many people behind the camera and so many people in front of the camera to try and keep this entertaining? Your content is on life support. It takes a small village to make you even moderately entertaining anymore. I mean, just what a fucking shame. What an absolute shame. Someone who was energetic and envelope pushing and who did weird shit and who felt like an honest and earnest member of the YouTube community has now become just this bloated, bloviating elitist. There's a concept I'll discuss a little later here with uh, another one of our entries. It's this idea of... You know, look, you can piss away an old audience, but you have to make a new audience. 
And I'm asking here, honestly, who's who knew is watching this shit? At least when he had Trisha Paytas, he was getting that kind of that drama uh, T group of people. But now he doesn't even have that. Uh, what, is he begging for scraps off Hassan Piker? Jesus. And so when I look at this, I, I just look at his relevancy and I say, yeah, this is clearly on a downward trajectory. This is not going great, folks. And it's only going to get worse in the next two and a half years. All right, because once again, this is an Ezra list, and I will cheat. Uh, this next entry was three people in one, because uh, fuck yeah. Lily Pons, Lily Singh, and Liza Koshy. For those of you that may recall, Lily Pons had a series of humor skits on YouTube. Uh, they're all pretty lame, although I must have been. I'm probably not the target demographic. She seems to now be pretty happy doing Spanish music videos, which makes some sense. Those people will watch fucking anything, and they will watch it a lot. That's sad. I mean, look, she clearly still has some relevance and means here. I mean, this is millions of views. It's more than she's ever got. As for her presence as a YouTuber and on the platform, it's pretty clearly diminished. She doesn't really make the skits anymore. It seems like she's moved on from that and is now doing something different. Something a little less personalityful. And speaking of lacking a personality, Liza Koshy. So Liza Koshy, for those of you who don't remember, had a YouTube original series that uh, nobody give a shit about, and thus nobody watches it anymore. I think they literally had to give away the first episode for free, and it still didn't work. She's since been bouncing around, doing various things, coming back after a few months to sell creams to people. I don't hear anybody talking about her anymore. Her fans seem to have gone to just literally anyone else. And it's not surprising. What was there about Liza Koshy that you couldn't get from anyone else? She's quirky and, and kind of like funny and generally kind of nice. All right. You know, I'm going to tell you a little personal anecdote here just to kind of end off her segment. Uh, I did see her once recently. I actually, in the last six months, I have thought about her. And that was on like the, what was it, like the Dick Clark New Year's Eve uh, bash in, in New York City. And, you know, I was watching this with my family. And I see on there Ryan Seacrest. And Ryan Seacrest is up there doing his typical Ryan Seacrest shtick, right? You know, it's, it's very tepid. And then he says, oh, yeah, we're going to throw it over to our friend here, Liza Koshy. And then Liza Koshy shows up, and uh, she interviews a few people very tepidly as well. And I just realized, wow, this is where she belongs. This is exactly what she needs to be doing. She really is the Ryan Seacrest of YouTube. And I don't think I've ever said anything meaner about anyone in my life. Lily Singh, the bisexual woman of color. Now, she's a YouTube comedian, and there's some questionable quotations of that one there, of course, folks. But you might remind her best for A Little Late with Lily Singh, an infamously awful late-night talk show that only lasted a couple seasons before being canceled due to COVID. Right. In any case, she's one of the many people who decided to break out of YouTube, found they weren't talented enough to do it, and then made the walk of shame back to YouTube. Someone who reached for the stars, didn't quite make it, and so thus burned up on re-entry back into Earth's atmosphere. I think that's how the saying goes, right? Nowadays, you can usually find her doing what she's always been doing, actually. Just making little skip videos, uh, work in the shorts game, which I can at least respect that. But it's, it's all just not quite what it was. Views aren't quite there, and neither is the relevancy. I mean, at least when she had the talk show host, people liked shitting on her. Now people don't even bother. I guess to summarize where her content and where her career is right now, I recently saw her in a Darman video. <laughs> Rip. Oh my god, just look at this mess. Ugh, I'm actually a little back end secret here, folks, some behind the scenes magic. This specific segment was re recorded no less than four times. And partially that's Nesquik neuroticism playing there, but some of it is also the fact that this situation has been rapidly devolving, so I had to kind of keep abreast of it. I mean, ugh. Uh, okay, okay, let, let's start with the basics. In a previous draft of this, I was, I, I guess, a little more conciliatory, and perhaps even a little optimistic. I, w I said, okay, look, it seems pretty clear that iDubs has lost most of his old audience. He's not really, he, he's lost their trust and lost their favor. But recently, this Creator Clash thing had just happened, and it looked like it was a pretty decent affair. People liked it, so maybe there's a viable path moving forward. This was, of course, recorded a few months after Creator Clash 1, but a few months before Creator Clash 2. Woo, that was, uh, <laughs> oh man, that was a... A few controversies ago, now wasn't it? For those of you who don't keep in the loop of useless internet drama, the basics are iDubs, a very big popular YouTuber, was putting on this boxing match between other YouTubers called Creator Clash. First one went off pretty decently, the second one had a bit of controversy wherein one of the fighters, by the name of Froggy Fresh, took a jab at iDubs' wife's OnlyFans. Something which iDubs has claimed he's totally cool with and very secure about, uh, so much so that he kicked the guy off the event. Now what's funny is, if he had handled it better, this could have come off as reasonable and respectable. If I'd have said, look, you're going to sit there and insult my fucking wife and think that I'm still going to invite you to my event. I own this event. You're the one that came to me for Clout Froggy. 
I don't have to work with people I don't like, and I'm not going to work with you if you're going to be that way. And anyone out there that's like, Idubs, you know, I lost respect for you over this. You know, fine, I understand. But just know this, I would have lost respect for myself if I didn't stand up for my wife. There you go. See, that, that alone, it's the same actions, but it's framed better, and it's more honest. But no, instead of being upfront and direct about it, he had to kind of hide behind corporate speak. And then after the event was over and the controversy had died out, he then released this video where he calls Froggy Fresh sensitive. Reminder, this is a guy that kicked a boxer off for telling a joke about his wife, but you're the sensitive one. And then he released another video where he like basically apologizes for his old videos, says he's going to list a few of them, have talked about how problematic they are. And, uh, uh, Idubs, I don't think you have the right to call anyone else sensitive anymore. It's what I'm trying to say. Now, there's been a lot of back and forth as to how good or bad this is. You know, a lot of his former fans feel kind of jilted, like, oh, he doesn't represent the, the ideals and principles I thought he did. Critics of them are like, ah, you guys are overreacting. He's just a fucking YouTuber. Okay, fine, fine. We can sit here and talk about how he's changed and if it's good or bad, all we want. But that's not the point of this video. Reminder, this video is talking about relevancy. And are people going to survive into the halfway point of the 2020s? I think in all this confusion, a few key facts have been left out. Uh, one, the, the obvious point, is he's falling out with his audience. That's pretty clear. But that's okay. That's actually okay. If you can replace them with the new audience. And that's where I pose the question to any iDubs fans or critics. What is the new iDubs about? What's his hook? What's his niche? What's his personality? Look at his recent videos. And tell me they're not just the most generic YouTube schlock you've ever seen. Videos about easy topics where the jokes are saved by jump cuts. It's tripe. It's the same kind of shit every other big YouTuber makes. When Elvis the Alien could convincingly remake one of your videos, both on a technical perspective and in terms of your perspective and how you're saying it, dude, you're fucked. <laughs> like, like, oh my god, that, that is... What a withering insult. You make Elvis the Alien videos. <laughs> yeah, I know he's a million subscriber channel. I don't give a shit. He still sucks. Maybe this is all starting to make sense. Maybe this is why iDubs is hanging out with a bunch of has-been and personalityless YouTubers. It's what he wants to become. Sad stuff. Especially when you consider how unique and dynamic iDubs used to be. What a tard. Well, all right. Four for four. Well done, Nesquik. Absolutely genius. You are truly the Nestradamus of YouTube. Oh, oh yeah. Um, it was top five YouTubers, wasn't it? Well, look, we don't need to talk about that fifth person, right? It's, who even was it anyways? If chimps were everywhere and they had full freedom, the way people do, we'd have a fucking serious problem. All right. Yeah. Okay. Fine. <laughs> okay. Look. To be completely honest, I totally botched the fifth prediction. It was Joe Rogan, and it's funny. Even in the original video, I was like, "Well, guys, hold up. I know he's the biggest podcaster right now, but what I'm trying to say is, uh, in a few years' time, he won't be as big. He'll still be pretty relevant, but not as relevant. It'll be like a notable drop." I, I like. I tried to temper the expectations so goddamn bad in my original video, and it still didn't work. How was I supposed to know he was going to become a conservative folk hero because Spotify censored a few of his podcast episodes? Ugh. Look, okay, that was a bit unforeseen, but. That wasn't the full reason why I got things wrong. To be completely fair, his strategy has been nothing short of genius. Uh, let me explain this though. My original thesis was he was not going to be able to continue having the level of success he had because he was going exclusive to Spotify. I thought that having the exclusivity would on the long run hurt his longevity as a content creator. I didn't realize though he'd still be posting clips to YouTube and that his fans would still ingeniously been posting clips to the YouTube shorts function taking out some of his weirdest moments, the, the kookiest shit he talked about, uh, silly edits. This was genius, and this, this marketed him in a way which, frankly, no amount of money could buy. He became not quite a meme, and not even quite a meme template. Uh, it, it's just, he became notable. He became very relevant, it, at like a, like a low harmonic. And that has kept him in the game for a lot longer than I ever figured he would. So, kudos to him. I was completely wrong. And I will say this, though. Of all the people on the list, he's the one I'm most okay with being wrong about. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. Now, obviously, the five years ain't up. The way I see it, I have to the end of 2025 to see how right or wrong I am. So two and a half years is a long time. And look, to be fair, for most of these people, there's a chance they could turn around their careers. So I don't want to, you know, prematurely celebrate and pat myself on the back too much. But let's be frank here. When it comes to fame, especially on the internet, it is so easy come, easy go that once you start to lose it, it's a pretty vicious cycle. So... I'm feeling confident about, like I said, four out of five of my choices, but we'll see where we go. So like I said, hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll talk to you later. Bye.